Peter Sagal. Once again, from TBS, Peter Sagal. <laughs> Shut the, no, I've got this, I've got this, shut the fuck up, I've got this, oh, you went and you fucking told me, you son of a bitch. <laughs> Can I also just say that I never, it never gets old for me to hear you swear. Yeah. <laughs> I will give you a dollar if you do that on the air next I will. week. <laughs> I got one right here, somebody threw it. <laughs> Venues where they frown on that. <laughs> this one is called He Goes Down Looking. The guy in front of us at the White Sox versus Red Sox game was standing up. The people in front of him were sitting. The people two rows behind him were sufficiently elevated and thus sitting. Thus, he was blocking the view of one person, the person in the seat directly behind him, my wife, Beth. <laughs> She activated her considerable blonde charm and asked him to sit down. The guy studied. The guy smiled at her, his reflective sports sunglasses giving him a bug-like mien. Are you kidding? He snapped with Paul Air go up, one out, the base is loaded, sit down, you should be standing up. He turned back to the game, remaining both upright and opaque. Talking baseball, Peter can't see nothing. Talking baseball, neither can his wife Beth. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> On the other side sat her eight-year-old Rose. Would she someday write an autobiographical play in which my failure to insist that the guy sit down take on the same mythic resonance as Willie Loman's woman from Boston? <laughs> Mama couldn't see, Papa! She would shout in the climactic scene. Paul Kinerka was up and she couldn't see and you didn't do anything! We're talking baseball, scarring his young daughter. Talking baseball, he's liked but he's not well liked. <laughs> I thought that was great. I, I, know, I, I love it. it. Not a smart bunch. All right. <laughs> but Rosie was concentrating on her journal, writing down rhyming titles for her projected series of historical adventure novels. Wacky Jackie, for example, in which her characters go back in time and play ball with Jackie Robinson. Paul Kinerko popped out. The guy sat down, deflated. Beth tapped him on the shoulder and said with a big smile, well, that was worth standing up for, wasn't it? <laughs> I should point out that my wife has the most disarming smile in the world. My daughters happily have inherited it, and I am encouraging them to pursue careers that will make full use of that gift, like talking elderly people out of their savings. <laughs> the guy turned around, considered Beth's charming smile and merry blue-green eyes, and let loose with a lengthy and considered obscenity in the form of a suggestion. As a lifestyle, spending your time drowning in self-recrimination for your lack of action has its drawbacks, but it does prepare you for the rare occasion when a chance to try again presents itself. I reposted with a similar obscenity, with the pronouns and tenses artfully switched around, so now the unprintable suggestion applied to him. <laughs> and so many had thought my BA in English literature had been wasted. <laughs> Singles person, talking baseball, he just earned a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> a notional dollar. I invited him to choose from among the many empty seats in our section, all of them far enough away to stand without bothering us. He glared at me, I assume, from behind his mirrored lenses. I've had these seats for 12 years, he said. How long have you had yours? Truthfully, about two hours. I fell silent, which is just one more indication that I was wise not to pursue a career as a cage match fighter. <laughs> Would you please just turn around and we can go back to having a good time? Beth asked. I'm having a great time, he said. Let's chat, let's have a good talk, anything else you want to do. My daughter was carefully writing down The Night Before the Light, her title for a novel about the invention of the light bulb. But this was a confrontation. I had to do something, surprisingly, for a person who does radio. I opted for visual comedy. I leaned in and used his reflective lenses as a mirror. <laughs> Hang on a second, I said. I want to rearrange my hair. Now! 
I have very little hair. In retrospect, I believe I was making his attributes subservient to my own utility, a gesture akin to wiping my nose on his shirt. And by invoking an imaginary need to do so, to reinvoke the metaphor, it was akin to wiping my nose in a shirt when I had no nose to begin with. I calculated, or rather calculate now, as I tried to justify a completely pathetic gesture, I'd be adding a nice frisson of additional humiliation. The top of days home, ex post facto bullshit talk again. Harvard is for losers. <laughs> you don't have any hair, he shot back. Ah, I had reduced him to the level of bald jokes. There was some satisfaction in that. Some very, very little satisfaction. <laughs> the guy and I stared at each other. At least I stared at him. Behind his glasses, he might have been weeping. I really don't know. Beth leaned forward and said, would you please, please just turn around? The guy took a second to contemplate his wide range of possible actions. Then, he turned around. Beth had diffused the situation by simply giving him the out of appearing gracious. I was, as I often am, amazed and gratified by her wisdom and restraint. Then she said to me in a full and clear voice, Don't be bothered by him, Peter. He's just a tiny, tiny man who has to pick fights to make himself feel better about his awful, sad little life. Talk baseball, <laughs> deploy the passive aggression. Talk baseball, <laughs> metaphorically insulted his penis. <laughs> he did nothing. We enjoyed the rest of the game, which the White Sox went on to lose. Rose never noticed a thing, busy as she was with inventing the title Crazy Cannons. She told me it would be a story about her heroes help avoid a war by making everyone laugh. <laughs> I hope they don't pretend to comb their hair using the other guy's sunglasses. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> Talking Peter, Mickey and the Duke. <laughs>